I'm Austin Lugo. I'm Andrew Harp. This is With Nothing to Say. Let's talk about Blood In, Blood Out. Before we get into this week's film, next week we're going to be watching The Color of Money. Uh, I thought in inspiration of the new Martin Scorsese film, Killers of the Flower Moon, we would do some Scorsese. I don't... Have we done any Scorsese on the podcast before? I know we talked that's a lot about King of Comedy. That's a good question. But yeah, I, don't know if we I, almost, were... almost, I almost feel like we like covered um, <laughs> uh, the King of Comedy, but I know we didn't. Um, you know, I feel like we just I'm talked about it. it a lot. Yeah, we talked about it a lot because I mean the movie rocks. Because it's um, an incredible film. Yeah. Um, no, I don't. I mean, you know, no, we never really covered one before. Um, wow. No. So, uh, Martin Scorsese, for those who don't know, a very underground filmmaker, creator yeah. of <laughs> what sixty films? How many films is this guy? Too many. Maybe not sixty. Is I don't know. At least a couple Same. dozen feature films. Says director of fifty seven films, but that includes shorts and yeah, docs. shorts documentaries and shit like that. <clears throat> but yeah, I mean oh, a bunch shit. of I mean like with the amount of feature films that he's produced, I mean you're pretty good. You know, it's uh I mean I mean, you know, I, I think it's fair to say I'm a huge fan. As everyone should be. I've n- never seen a bad Scorsese film. I've seen Scorsese films I don't love. I think one of the one. his I think one that isn't very good. Um, well, it's good. I think I barely like it, but it's a little like, I don't know. It has like, the quality is a little like, you know, it kind of mm-hmm. goes back and forth between being bad and good. It's like Gangs of New York. There's a lot about it to appreciate, but there's also a lot about it that is kind of rough. Um. Oh, and Hugo. When was the last time you watched <laughs> Hugo? I've never seen Hugo. I don't really have any interest in seeing Hugo. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's like his, it's like his like fantasy kids movie. I remember, yeah. I think I watched it like several years ago before I even watched like, you know, a good amount of his movies. And if I remember correctly, it's like a cheap looking fantasy kids CGI mm-hmm. fest. So yeah. I'm not really, I'm interested to seeing how it is aged, but um. Mm. I, uh, you know, it's a kid's movie. I don't know if it's, if I really care all that much, but anyway, yeah. I realized, uh, I'd never seen New York. You'd never seen New York, New York before. I've never seen New York, New York no. either, but I know a lot about that film. I always wanted to see that one. I mean, we're not, we're doing color purple, but maybe I'll, I always color say I'm going to watch like, yeah, I, I always say I'm going to color, color money, money. <laughs> not color, color purple. purple. That's Steven Spielberg. <laughs> A very different movie, yeah. I think. <laughs> it sure is. I don't really, uh, I don't know, New York, New York, that's one of his, like, uh, that's another one of his movies that people don't really care for as much. Well, I think one of the things that I find, like, endlessly fascinating about New York, New York is whenever I read, like, biographies of, like, filmmakers, which I haven't read a Scorsese one yet, but I always try to read, like, at least, you know, once one a month, and I've read, like, one on you know, Kubrick, well, a couple on Kubrick and uh, Fred Astaire and all these different people. And whenever, like, there's one around, like, the 1970s, for some reason, like, everyone has a story about New York, New York. Like, every director, everyone who's, like, worked. Just because, like, it's such a strange film for Scorsese. Because, like, by this point, like, Scorsese is the Scorsese. I mean, it's right after Taxi Driver, right? So it was, like, Taxi Driver was, like, his big hit, right? It's when, like... right. Everyone's like, oh, shit, the Scorsese guy, like, he knows his shit. And mm-hmm. it was, like, super over budget. Like, they shot way longer than they were supposed to. Yeah, and they're, they're just, like, yeah. all of this, like, shit goes wrong. And then it immediately flopped. Like, it yeah, was in theaters worry. for, like, two weeks. And after that, like, Scorsese went into, like, this, like, deep depression. And he was, like, fucking, right, like, yeah. I mean, he's, he was always doing the drugs. But, like, it was, like, one of his, like most intense moments yeah. with drugs and all this stuff so i think i don't know if i'm that interested in the movie new york new york i'm just really interested in like the story behind it because it's so 
weird and strange and it's probably other than the last temptation of christ which of course is also famously just like extremely harrowing and all this shit went wrong poor scorsese someone like that shouldn't have to go through although i i mean he's we always think of him like now as like this really nice like cinema guy but he was a real asshole in like the 70s just from what i've read <laughs> yeah it was probably all that cocaine <laughs> Whenever I read a profile of him, he always seems like a nice guy. Yeah. He probably I think is he... just like mellowed more with like age and fatherhood and grandfatherhood and all this stuff. Exactly. Yeah. I think he's definitely a nice guy now, but I think that's something he's grown into because from all the biographies I've read of people around him, he seemed like quite the asshole at the time. And I, that might have just been the cocaine and just like the world that he was living in and underground new york and all that shit so yeah who's to say but i'm excited i'm ready for yeah. says i mean we've talked about king of comedy for so long i mean i think we have like three or four after shows where like we spent basically an hour just talking about king of comedy yeah we i mean like i watch it, talking about that watch movie. it yeah yeah i mean like it's so <laughs> it's, it's so, so good it's so cool uh <laughs> yeah it's uh it's undeniably good <laughs> but today uh, ironically yeah. enough, we're watching a movie that I picked because one of my students, who I've been really struggling with to get to read anything, we've been reading Lord of the Flies for the past two months, and over the course of 30 classes, so over like 30 hours, uh -huh. he's read like 30 pages, <laughs> and yeah. it's been quite a struggle, so I've tried like all these different ways to sort of connect with them you know we've listened to like music and try to connect to like different like artists he likes and rappers he likes and eventually we tried this blood in blood out which sort of worked a little bit because i mean this kid's seen this movie dozens of times which is very strange movie for a 15 year old to love this much like i don't know why he has such an obsession with this movie it's interesting it's it's kind of yeah. it's coming it's it's the movie's a little antiquated. It is. It's strange because maybe it has something to do with like his home life. He's originally from like Stockton, California, like a back part of California, and there's a lot of like, gang stuff and violence, and he's Latino, and I think he really identifies with some of the characters in this piece, but it's still strange because when I talk to most of my kids about like movies that they like, first of all, none of them like movies. I don't know if this is like across the board for teenagers or if it's just in my <laughs> rural community, but I talk to them about movies and they're like, I don't watch movies. Like I don't watch TV. I'm baffled by it, this. It takes, I don't know. It takes too long. <laughs> it's too much time. It's like, it's a two hour commitment. It's very strange, but this movie was a movie that uh, he picked basically for the podcast. And then I, I said, ironically, because he's moving in like two weeks. So he's not even going to be in my class because <laughs> of course he's not. Like I spent like seven weeks trying to get this kid to read a book and now he's just yeah up and leaving. I Whatever. Just, I guess just the name of the game. <laughs> I guess so. But I, I was genuinely surprised by how many famous names there are in this piece. Yeah, like it's just, a pretty like a lot of people in it. A lot of dudes. I'd never heard of this movie before, which it has a couple of different names, right? Because like on YouTube, it's Blood In, Blood Out. But then on like Letterboxd. Letterboxd, it says Bound By on there. Yeah. Yeah. And if you watch look up YouTube, the movie. Like, yeah. Yeah. If you look up the movie Blood anywhere Blood other out, than. Yeah. 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 So I don't know what. I think we talked about the idea that like, it might be has something to do with. Like one of the names, like Blood In, Blood Out might be the name it was given in Spanish and then they translated that back in English, kind of like that weird way that there's like that circular translation. It's like bound by honor might've been the original name, but yeah. then the Spanish name was something sort of like blood in blood out. And then they translated that back in English and that's how it became that. Well, he, but he literally says blood and blood out in the movie. Like one he of does. the characters does. <laughs> like, I, so, I don't think it's like a, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. know. <laughs> it's just whatever. I, I like to think blood and blood out is the proper title. I think it's a better title, um, honestly. Well, I mean, they literally say it in the movie, and I don't ever think any of them ever say the 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 phrase "bound by honor." Bound by honor? As, no. Yeah, I mean, 
I guess Bound by Honor isn't like the worst title. I guess it kind of makes sense. It's more literal, I guess. Because yeah, yeah, everybody kind of is like like basically obsessed with the concept of honor <laughs> and like, you know, honoring yourself, your family, your, you know, your friends, and you know, all this stuff. So I guess that kind of comes into play a lot. Um Yeah. So, but whatever. <laughs> yeah, there's this very big push for this idea of what it means to be a family and these different identities that we take on as humans, not just the identities of our literal family, which is something that he faces, but the identities of the created family, right? Sort of like the blood versus water, like blood's thicker than water sort of metaphor, but this idea that sometimes the families that we create is stronger than the families that we're kind of put into this idea that sort of fate or destiny sort of puts us into a family. We don't have really a choice in that, but the family that we create, the family that we choose, the it's the often calls like cousins, which is a thing that's very popular in the community that I work in, which is a very large like Latino community. So just like in some urban communities, they utilize the term like brother to refer to people of the, the same culture. Yeah, same group, and, same. You know, yeah, it's kind of like the same thing. Whatever. Like, barrio, yeah, they, they like it. say like <laughs> they often say they'll call their friends cousins because Cus. yeah, hey, cu. <laughs> hey, cu. hey, because hey, homes. Uh, they call I each know, other I guess homes. Essay. Homes. <laughs> essay. Uh, yeah, cuz. <laughs> yeah, yep. but it's this idea that we choose cousins, our families, though, right? I think they literally are cousins, though. The they characters. They are. So there, there's that, too. But then they call other people yeah. cousin, too. So it, it's right, kind of, of like course, yeah. playing off of that idea of, like, yeah, family. And, and like, cousins, like, it's interesting because it's not brother, right? So they're not, like, the idea isn't that they're, like, so close to them, that they're basically a brother, but they're still closer than if they were well, just, like, someone on the street or even a friend. Right. <laughs> it's, it's... um. Yeah, it's kind of weird in that way. Um, but I think, well, I think uh, Paco and Cruz, I think they're both half-brothers, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. They're half-brothers. Um, and then Miklo, he is a cousin of the two half-brothers. Um, and Miklo, he is a... He, he, is, uh, he is a Mexican-American. I mean, I, I think the idea is that his mom is Mexican and his dad is white. Yeah. Um you see his father at the beginning. Um uh, you know, you get like Miklo. I I I like I love the beginning of the movie by the way. The are you, when you say the beginning are you talking about like the opening scene with the like the, the intro. Yeah, stuff? Yeah, yeah. When yeah, when he No, no, no. No, well that's not really that's not really Dio de los Muertos stuff. It's just like it's the introduction of the East, you know, Los Angeles area. Right. Yeah. Like Miklo arrives. He's back home. He's clearly from somewhere else. You know, it's set up very easily from the front that it's set up very simply that he is from there and he's back home after being away for, I think, 18 months. I think he gets like, what, a tamale, a tamale at the <laughs> store. Yeah. He's like, yes. And he's like, he loves it. Loves and, you know, he's, He's seeing everyone. You're getting all the shots of all the um, religious murals and stuff. And I just kind of like how it sets up kind of like the city of like, um, well, the area of East uh, Los Angeles, kind of how it sets it up as like a character, sets up the place, um, you know, pretty simply and very um, fast in a fast pace, you know, entertaining kind of way. Yeah, I think a lot of movies that take place in Los Angeles, they don't actually have like much of a feel of los angeles it's kind of like i was yeah, listening sure. yeah. to this author who came to unr a couple of nights ago tyreek white he just wrote his first book which is called a haunting something i don't remember but it seems like a really intriguing book and the book is all about this sort of like new york that we don't see i realize it's the opposite of the country but it's a similar idea where whenever we see films about new york or Los Angeles in this case, you always see like the same four blocks 
you always see like the same thing, right? When it comes to New York, yeah, you yeah, always sure. see Central Park yeah. and Soho and that sort of thing. And that's the case with Los Angeles too, is you kind of always see, even if you think of movies that are like about Los Angeles, it's often like those same four areas. And what I love about this movie yeah. is we kind of like to see the underbelly of Los Angeles, like true proper Los Angeles, what it actually looks like and just how Well yeah, and like yeah, like it's clearly like a lot of people live there. They're from there. <laughs> it's a huge yeah. part of the area. It's obviously like a very rich, culturally rich, you know, neighborhood area, has its own problems and um, you know, but also, you know, um, you know, like I said, you know, culture and, and customs and everything, you know, it I think he like, I think he Miklo literally says like Oh, East Los, you're from East Los Angeles? Yeah, but it's an own, it's its own place or its own world or whatever. Like he kind of, mm -hmm. he's saying up front the fact that like, like, yeah, like it's, we're in Los Angeles, but like it might as well, yeah, be another state or another country or whatever. Country. Because, you know, it's a big, it's a big place and, you know, and, 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 and again, you know, a lot of people live there and we're not really ever going to stray from this area at all, except when we go to prison. Yeah, it's very much a film about identity, particularly Miklo, of course, because he Yeah, is... the number one guy. Yeah. About that. The way he looks isn't typical to Latino, right? He has his skin is lighter. He has blue he eyes. Looks white. I think. Yeah, he looks white. Yeah, he has blue eyes. And so it's him always on the outside. Like he never feels like he fits in anywhere. He never feels yeah. out feels like he fits in with any of his people with any of his he's made fun of all the time communities yeah. he's constantly made fun of for how he looks how he dresses how he exists in the world and he's sort of in this limbo between spaces so whenever he goes to a new space which this film is so much about how setting creates identity and creates culture just like when he's in east los angeles he has a specific identity a specific culture that he tries to fit into but it sort of works, but then also kind of doesn't. And then when he goes to prison, it's kind of the same thing. He's trying to like find his in group, trying to find the people that he belongs to and how he sort of utilizes his identity, particularly when he's in prison to subvert situations in which he's able to work with both the Latino gang and the uh, white supremacist gang simultaneously. I mean, it's all, it's kind of like an underground sort of, twisted contorted thing but uh -huh. <laughs> i don't know where i was going with that <laughs> no i feel you i feel you yeah 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 that's a big part of the miklo character right of course is that like yeah he um he's like trying to like prove himself right to other chicano and latino people right to say like i am one of you you know look how far look look at me and how far i will go for you um and he does that right from the beginning of the movie right like beginning of the movie it's like what 1972 he's supposed to be 18 years old but he doesn't look 18 at all he looks like he's like 35 it's like um, one of those movies where you have the same actor play all the different ages and yeah <laughs> <laughs> he probably should have been playing an 18 year old yeah whatever anyway it's fine who cares he he left Las Vegas because his dad was like a he's he's an asshole. Um yeah. and he meets up with his friends Paco and Cruz, who all they're, they're members of the Vatos Locos gang, which I believe is a real gang, gang if I'm not mistaken. Or something like no that. Idea. Is it? Um it means crazy dudes. <laughs> Vatos Locos. That's crazy I mean dudes. it's a great gang name. Well, not in English, yeah, but the, the Spanish gang name's pretty cool. Yeah. And all Miklo wants to do, Miklo, he meets all of his buddies. He meets Paco and Paco. He is like kind of basically like the de facto leader, right? He's kind of like um, an asshole. He's violent. And uh, yeah. he like, they point out that he's like a boxer. Like he's kind of like, um, I don't know. Yeah. He just seems kind of, um, he's a bit crazy. And then, Cru <laughs> and then Cruz is like a budding artist. He's very good. Yeah. Um, he does like cars and paintings. They show a scene at the beginning where he wins like an award for one of his paintings and a scholarship to college, like art school. And so he's like really good and everyone's really happy about it. And that night after he wins, of course, 
well before that they attack like a a, a, a a rival gang another gang of chicanos and through that miklo gets a um he, he's able to join the gang and he's very stoked about it and then to celebrate cruz is trying to have sex in a car um and then he is attacked by the gang again uh and they 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 fuck him up very violently um this they, movie is very violent <laughs> it's pretty violent yeah um relatively so it's more talking than violence uh sure most, for the most part there's a lot of talking but when they do beat up crews they do so like pretty crazily <laughs> um they like they like yeah they like uh what they like cut his hand like they like cut yeah. off like a piece of his hand and then they like throw him like like on his back onto like a top of a fire hydrant which is like insane that um, just looks so painful <laughs> that was terrible <laughs> yeah like, oh, and, and, and yeah they're just basically like they he, he lives but they're basically just like yeah like he'll for at least a while he'll be he'll be messed up like he won't be able to walk mm-hmm. he'll never be the same which I mean, I guess if I was thrown onto a fire hydrant, it's just like one of those scenes. I wouldn't where, like, be happy about it. Yeah, it makes you like flinch. Like your skin's just like ugh, crawls. Yeah, it makes you kind of. It does. It does make you cringe. Yeah. <laughs> that moment is so violently wonderful, and I, I did not expect that from this movie. I wasn't really sure what to expect, but being thrown onto on top of a fire hydrant is creative and intriguing, and and just so vivid an image in a moment just like the way you can feel it in a way you can't really feel when someone's kind of getting punched or shot or even knives like there's something empathetic about that moment like i don't know why because i don't know anyone who's ever fallen onto a fire hydrant before but, but it's almost There's like you can feel it in a way that <laughs> you can't with these other things like it feels more grounded and, and genuine and I, I would say that's true about a lot of the fight scenes here is they feel very sort of ground in this world as if these are people who thought about like how would this fight actually go down you know how do we actually it's not like your fancy john wake you know kung fu style movements it's much more like if no it's not teenagers it's not an adults movie. i would not say no. <laughs> i would not say it's an action movie it's like a drama absolutely not like it's like a a crime drama right like a grounded crime drama drama um for the most part i would say like there's like elements that it, everything feels like <laughs> because I think it's a movie, quote unquote movie, a feature film, everything does feel like punched up to like an intense yeah. dramatic level. Sure. Um, but that's okay. I, I, I don't, uh, I think it's fine. I can see some people watching it and maybe thinking like, this is like too over the top, like in terms <laughs> of like the way that people talk or the way that people act or whatever, um, the way that people respond to things. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But it's just like, that's just, you know, it's a movie. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I don't know. It's kind of like the, I mean, it kind of reminds me of the, like the outsiders a little bit. Yeah. There's definitely some outsiders vibes going on here. Just like the yeah. way everything sort of is the biggest deal in the world, which is true it, about it goes, it goes from, it goes from like bad, like, like, yeah. yeah. Like that story that like with this story, everything is just constantly going from bad to worse. Like no one can ever catch a break. I mean, it's just, Awful incident right. after awful incident. And, and I, because, I love that. Yeah. Yeah. No, continue. Sorry. I I love that juxtaposition, which is done in a, a lot of films, but I think rarely done well. But I think it is done well in this film, which is when someone from a poor community becomes a professional mm -hmm. artist and stepping into that world, which is like... Sure even though it's very cheap to make art for some reason, like the world of art, particularly painting and sculpting is such like a rich person thing for whatever reason. I wouldn't, and I so mean, you're, uh, have you ever been to an art store where you have to buy like canvases and paint and like supplies and I stuff like not. that? Like <laughs> these items are not cheap. They are not cheap. <laughs> uh, it is not a, especially cheap if you're having multiple, like a gallery, like it's not like sure. the cheapest thing to do. Um, but I know what you mean. Um, when you look at it, it's just one item, one product, and you yeah. know, you know, you try to get people to buy it for like two hundred, three hundred dollars, maybe. So I know what you mean. Yeah, it's like this 
I guess what I mean isn't so much like the painting of canvas itself, but right, this is someone who okay. comes yeah, yeah. traditionally from tagging cars and like train cars yeah. and so from spray painting and that is a much cheaper hobby because all you have to do is buy the spray paint which is like 20 bucks or whatever oh, i don't know yeah, what it was yeah, in the yeah. 1990s i know what you mean yeah the idea that like as an you can basically create art even in the 1990s pretty much extremely cheaply but then it can be sold for like extreme amounts of money right hundreds of thousands of dollars and so it's kind of stepping between these worlds and this root world that he's trying to come into and it's not an accident that the world he steps into is a bunch of like rich white people and his boss is like a white right woman. exactly yeah because there's very much this idea of what it means to be masculine in this movie which isn't something yeah. i necessarily agree with i i understand the argument that they're trying to make about what it means to be a man and what it means to be masculine all that kind of stuff but sometimes the way they portray female characters which there's not very many female characters in this film but what few female characters there are often are either either like that white woman who's kind of like this evil matriarchal woman or they're sort of just these side characters that just add something to the plot they're not really part of the story like they're just kind of to say which i mean a lot of this movie does take place in prison so i guess there's that too like at least right what a two hours of this movie in prison I thought after they would leave prison, I didn't think they'd go back to prison again. I did not that's, expect. It, that's honestly more prison that is stuff. so that is so audacious. Where like he leaves prison and he goes right back, and it's literally like another hour of like prison stuff. It's like wow, I can't believe they really did that. It's kind of I love how audacious that is to just be like, yep, we're right back uh, to prison after being gone <laughs> for like barely any amount of time. I love that they did that. I it, love the scene. Well, yeah. Sorry. No. What, what's, what were you gonna say? Well, I was just going to like talk about like the beginning of the movie back to the beginning about like I like the um I do like the beginning where they like um take their revenge and they kill Spider of yeah. Tres Puntos and they uh I like to like they 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 beat him up really badly and they cut him and then he pulls out a gun to shoot them and then uh Miklo he shoots and kills him and I love that I love that reaction that's such a good moment when he when he kills him because he doesn't he didn't really want to kill him right so he's just like no like he's like <laughs> he, he's so upset about the fact that he killed him just because like you know he's like his life is basically ruined right like he mm -hmm. kind of you know essentially ru made ruined his life right like uh and like he knows it and he's on probation or parole or whatever and uh um and you know they have a little car chase and then uh there's that moment where like he's bleeding that kind of reminds the movie kind of reminds me of reservoir dogs in a weird way too maybe it's just the 90s yeah no i felt that it. too there's definitely some reservoir dogs vibes going on i don't know why but <laughs> they're undercover cops in the movie and i guess that's um, part of it you know and like he's gonna bleed and then like paco instead of like running away he grabs him even though they know they'll get arrested and they get arrested, and then Miko goes to prison. Um, San Quentin, uh, which I believe is actually San Quentin. I believe that's the actual prison. Oh, um, really? I mean, it looks like it a is. real prison. <laughs> it does. It does look like real prison. It doesn't look too much different from um, uh, when we uh, Alcatraz. Yeah, <laughs> it looks very similar. It most certainly does. There's lots, of, which I guess I mean, you know, there's only so much you can do in a prison which i'm not a huge fan of prison movies so like when they went back what? to prison part of me like kind of groaned i was like more prisons but at the same time we've covered it is... a lot of movies we've covered we've like, done a, a lot, lot of, of prison of movies <laughs> of like well yeah or at least like ones that have that like malcolm x have has like an extended prison, prison sequence when he goes to prison of course escape from alcatraz is just like the prison movie right is like the greatest prison <laughs> movie i don't know what it is um I don't mind them at all. I just, uh, you know, I, I think it, you know, uh, a lot of people live in prison, you know. And actually, the thing about this movie is that the screenplay is partly written by a guy named Jimmy Santiago Santiago Baca, who is a uh, poet. He went okay. to prison for like a handful of years. Um, really? Yeah, for like drug related stuff, I think. So it's like kind of based on his own, partly on his own experiences. Experience. Interesting. I mean, all of the stuff inside the prison feels 
very authentic and grounded. I, I mean, it's also hard to say because my only experience of prison is very much from films and literature. So I, no, yeah, we'll never know. We'll never know what it's actually like <laughs> to be in prison. Hopefully, like, we'll never know. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully, we'll never know. It doesn't seem great. Um, and I'm assuming it was really bad in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s. Well, it's probably still bad imagine. today. Yeah, um, just bad in a yeah. different way. Right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, they're in the prison for a long time. And I, there is, I guess, like, I guess you could argue that maybe it's too much compared to, like, the other characters. I'm a big fan of the Paco character. I think um, the actor Benjamin Brad is really good. Yeah. Yeah. There's some quality performances in here. I think my favorite character is probably Cruz. Who's the Cruz is the painter, right? Yeah. Yeah. I find him to me the most interesting of all the characters. I think one of the things I struggled with with this film is there's a lot of characters and just a lot of things going on. I mean, it's yeah, three hours. Know, it's it's so a long movie. Yeah, stuff, there's but... a lot of like, yeah, it's um, it gets pretty uh, you know, it gets pretty complex. Um, there's with just everybody's how everyone is a whole bunch of storylines, and they are all like crossing each yeah. other and sort of like running into each other because they're all part of like they all start in like the same community but then they kind of wander off in these different directions and then they come back and i think cruz is the most interesting particularly that moment which you kind of know what's going to happen right when you see that kid run into their painting slash heroin yeah. done you know what's going to happen and yet still it's like such a icky moment I mean, it's a kid overdosed on heroin. Like he's a twelve-year-old kid. So how could that not oh, be? Oh yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> yeah, you know, I will say some. The thing about this movie is that I feel like it's a little bit ahead of its time. If this story was like adapted into an HBO or FX television show in like the two thousands, it would be considered one of the greatest shows of all time. <laughs> Can you imagine like something like along the something along the lines of like production style and extended into like multiple, maybe like three, four, five seasons, but with something kind of like with like the weight and like production of like like the wire or the sopranos? That's a, the or... wire was like the very first show I thought of when I started watching this. Just like the way they tell a story and kind of like these overlapping worlds. Yeah. I mean, if if they adapted this, and I agree, if they adapt this into a TV show, which I it guess might, they it could might have do, been I mean, better. I don't know. I, no. Yeah, like I, honestly, I just, like honestly, yeah. I was thinking that too. Like maybe they should, because I mean, I don't know. I I feel like there's a lot there. I feel like there's a lot of potential for like an HBO Showtime FX type show. Yeah. Where, I mean, like there are so many shows that are like this, right? Like, and people would exactly. like it because it also it would be highlighting, you know, the East Los Angeles, you know. Uh, you know, Mexican cultures, you know, mm -hmm. I, I, there are plenty of shows that have done that over the years to try to highlight like certain cultures, like put a spotlight on them and, you know, hire actors, of course, of that descent to portray them. Right. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know, like there's, a, there's a lot of things in here that I think of age really well, just in, in terms of like the, 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 you know, um, you know, what it's trying to do, I guess, like the issues with like the prison you know, mm -hmm. uh, culture, like you said, masculinity, you know, these things, racism, like, I don't think these things have necessarily gone away, of course. So <laughs> I don't know. Someone's got to, someone's got to pick this up. Someone's got to like, find get, get, you know, Jimmy Santiago back on the phone and be like, <laughs> we need to like, bring it back. Do, you know, a season after season of this show like i don't know i just for me it seemed like that would have been a great idea <laughs> but maybe it's too late now since the movie's already been made so to all of our listeners write a letter to mr hbo himself and we will convince no them i'm not saying that me. i'm saying like <laughs> no no i'm not saying that because that's stupid like we need to get like i'm, I'm saying like if you are a i'm just saying i'm just giving so I'm just giving whoever's listening business advice. Like if you own the rights to the movie, <laughs> then you need to like get this everybody on to board do. to it. You really should probably, and I'm not even saying that I necessarily want to watch the show because I don't really watch <laughs> TV. I'm just saying like, it would be a good idea. Like w there's no doubt about it. Right. <laughs> I, I would watch the show. I think 
that's probably my biggest yeah. complaint with this film is it's too it's like ambitious. not long enough right so it's no yeah. like three hours is very long time but yeah, it's still it could be a great show uh, there's just there's too much here i think it really needs that i mean we don't even need like six or seven seasons of this i'm not saying we need like the wire style where there's just fucking a million episodes or well, sopranos well, which is kind of the same well, thing why are in Sopranos though? I mean, like, you know, it's like a good round, like five or six seasons, right? Like I'm okay. <laughs> that to me is like almost like the, you know, every star, star Trek, they, for like the, like the big ones, like TNG and Deep Space yeah. Nine, seven seasons done, you know, like they, they, <laughs> they ended all to me. Like that's a nice, you know, round number five, six, seven seasons. Perfect. <laughs> Anything more than that? I think we're, you know, it's getting a little, it's getting too, too long. Um, yeah. <laughs> no, I I think it's a lot of really intriguing ideas that you could sort of follow different storylines and you could do something like The Wire where like each season takes place in like a different part of Los Angeles. So, like the first season could be like sure. basically the movie, which is like East Los Angeles. And then you could do another season, which is, I don't know, Los Angeles, another part of Los Angeles that isn't like East Los Angeles. I mean, I'm sure there's tons of neighborhoods and different communities that you could explore, which would be really well, I think, intriguing. I don't know. I think, I think East Los Angeles is big enough that you could do a whole show on it. Why not? Or the prison. Yeah. I mean, you could do multiple like, seasons. I was the just... prison, the prison, like the, the movie, like you said, is over ambitious because it has all the prison <laughs> stuff and then it has all the East Los Angeles stuff. And those two things together is a great combination. And I think the movie's good. It's just like, it's so much like stuff going on. Um, that, yeah, like that's almost like two shows in itself, almost. It is. Yeah, it's basically two completely separate films that are sort of like tied in by these little things. But now I'm not stuck on this wire train because then I want to see like a season in East Los Angeles, a season in the prison, and then like, yeah, I don't know, a season <laughs> in like these different places, which I, I mean, we've talked about the wire a lot because I watched all what six or seven seasons not too long ago. And we talked about my many problems with it, which I don't think the wire is nearly as good as people think it is. But I think there are some interesting things. And I really did like the school season because that season was very well good the other seasons are just fine but <clears throat> i do love kind of the wire idea where you have like some of the same characters but each season they're kind of in a different place and they're exploring sort of a different corruption which i think would be interesting or like you could do like each season you follow like a different gang so like in this season we follow this gang and then the next season we follow another gang from east los angeles there's so many good things that could be done with this but have not yet been done I mean, yeah, it could I still happen. <laughs> oh. Yeah. But overall, I'm okay with the movie as is. Um mm. uh and again, you know, like we say, um the movie really uh takes place a lot in prison because Minkel goes to prison after killing the guy. <laughs> um so when he goes to prison, of course, too, Paco joins the Marines, which is a big yep. surprise. Um, and then he becomes a cop. And Cruz becomes addicted to opiates and heroin because mm -hmm. of his fucked up back. Um, and these are kind of like the, you know, push and pull elements of it. Um, and like we said, you know, Miklo, he's in prison. He gets an introduction to the San Quentin kind of like um, uh, the way, you know, the, the status quo, right? There's like yeah. the BGA, which is like the black... Power. gang and then there's like the Aryan vanguard which of course is the white you know racist people and the la onda which is uh the uh like uh the you know chicano mexicans latino mm -hmm. people um and uh you know he give he's given an introduction of all that stuff and he kind of you know of course he wants to you know join la onda and he has to do all this crazy stuff in order to join including but not limited to um Essentially seducing one of the racist guys, the like leader of the racist group, or one of the leaders. He, he, he seems to he's be not. There. Yeah, he seems to be a leader of that group, and he's also he also appears to have like power. He he runs like the gambling books for them, right? I think right, and so yes. he is like kind of he's powerful there. He's powerful to the point where he can basically say, like, I'm not going to give you any food because uh, he works in the kitchen. So, like, the black people. The, 
officers too. He bribes people so he can get away with like, you know, being, uh, you know, uh, taking, keeping food away from, you know, the black people and from the Mexican people. And, um, and so they're just like, look, this guy is making our lives worse. You need to kill him. <laughs> and so, and so, but, and he wants to, uh, you know, have sex with, uh, Miklo. And yes. so Miklo seduces him and he gets him into a situation where he does kill him. That whole scene, by the way, was really great where, uh, he goes and does, he goes and does it right. Where he goes and kills yeah. the guy. That's a great scene where like, they like, they, they have a distraction and he goes in and then there's a guard there and then it gets like, it's like, Oh, shit, you know, it's a good scene. It's a great moment of just like, Again, just always things going wrong and just everything being... Because yeah. not only does he got to kill this guy and try to seduce him so he can kill him, but now there's the guard there and there's all this stuff going on. Of course, there's like all this cash laying around. It's a wonderful moment. Again, some problematic ideas and identities of what it means to be masculinity and perhaps some views on homosexuality that aren't great. <laughs> I mean, obviously, this guy is a racist that rapes other men so you know he's not great but also like their views on masculinity and femininity still another moment where perhaps not painted in the best of lights perhaps and that would probably be something that we would change in our upcoming tv show yeah our tv show that we're producing (laughs) yep um again i never been to prison so i don't know what it's like (laughs) I have no idea. <laughs> so I mean, I don't know. This no could, it could be. It could be like that. I really just sure. don't know. No idea. Um. Yeah, but uh, yeah, no, I know what you mean. Uh, <laughs> this movie has so much stabbings too. There's a lot of stabbing. So many stabbings. <laughs> there, it's like the, 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 the there's a lot. Anyway, um, yeah, he kills the the, the racist cook guy. And um, um, he is now in La Onda, and this is where kind of like the movie fucking goes off the rails a little bit, just in terms of like, you know, he now that he's in La Onda, uh, he it's like things are getting like really complicated, and then I think too <laughs> like, like he joins La Onda, and then he you know he does like the gambling books. You know, and he keep, they keep like stacking more and more money. Uh, again, this is only in the prison, by the way. All while all this is going on, too, you got the other characters doing their shit. Mm-hmm. So much going. He basically works his way up the ladder. Like he starts kind of at the low end, and after the killing, like he's in, and then he starts like collecting gambling stuff, and then he sort of yeah. you kind of see this montage of him working <laughs> his way to becoming one of the lieutenants, sergeants. I don't know what exactly the call basically yeah, one yeah, of the whatever. leaders of the group and he basically runs the prison like he's living his best life i mean he's living the life i mean he, he basically says like this life is pretty much as good as it gets when you're in prison which yeah no he's I mean, like having a good time like he has a lot of power <laughs> he has more power yeah. there than he did like in the real world essentially yeah which is another intriguing thing and i think that's one of the things <clears throat> Even though I, I, I don't love prison movies necessarily, and you know I, I did groan a little bit about him going back to prison, but what I think is interesting is I'm thinking of that Paul Schrader film, The Card Counter, and the way that when people are incarcerated for long periods of time, or even short periods of time, they become accustomed to a very specific way of living in the world. And so when you put them out into the regular population, a lot of time they just can't exist there, they, right? They, they can't, can't do it. Yeah, and he's been there for like, what, like 10 years, basically. And yeah, Miklo yeah. gets out and he's like, yep, I got parole. You know, I had to do all this stuff to get it. Um, and then he's outside. Um, he has the worst job of all time. <laughs> he doesn't have a place to live because he has no money. Um, he has no family. His friends can't really help him out too much. I mean, his um, life is so, significantly worse on the outside than it was when he was like immediately, immediately, yeah, <laughs> and, and 
<laughs> and and for a lot of people, I'm sure that's you know the case, right? Like yeah. you know, they, they you know you leave and there's really there's really no like social safety net to like kind of like help you when you when you get out. Um, and you know you can't really get just any job because you're a convict. Um, so you're limited to a very specific type of job, and and not then because you're on parole, either. and of course that just shows in the movie too. Like if you're on parole, then whoever is your employer can um, discriminate against you and withhold money from you and threaten to call your parole office. You know, it's like the whole thing is just a complete, you know, just nightmare. Um, and Miko, he's just like fuck it, like I'm gonna. He he meets like uh, some more gang member guys, and he's just like, "I'll are you guys are doing a heist to rob a van? Like I will do that." Because <laughs> I just mean, like, fuck it, it's not worth it. Yeah, he's put in a position where like he's doing everything in his power to try to not go back to prison. Like he legitimately tries to be a, a citizen of the world. I mean, he works hard. He really tries. Shifts. Yeah, he's doing everything he can. He tries to get his own place and all this stuff, but. I mean, not only was it a thing at the time, but I'm sure it's still very much the thing today where there's just so much power held by the parole officer and the employer that they basically control your life to a degree that's almost impossible to live. And for Miklo, I mean, I think part of him's like, I kind of want to go back to prison because at least in prison, yeah. I had a world where I lived in and in he a lot buddies. of ways his life was significant. He had friends he lived in a world where he could actually exist i mean his living arrangement really was better in prison <laughs> than it is in he had a bed. Dead life. like because as your parole officer makes clear it's like you have to live in a very specific place and so like that's why he has to live in that like really shitty apartment and it's just the whole power structure is awful and i understand like there has to be something in place but obviously this is not the solution i mean it's just it's frustrating because this is legitimately a conversation that i've been having with some of my kids because i i have a lot of my students who have spent time in juvenile detention centers and a few who because they're old enough have spent time in like a proper prison and i try to explain to them that particularly if you're in juvenile detention, like that can be wiped from your record. So when you go off in the real world, like you won't be marked a felon. You can ask for it to be what was that called? Expunged, I think. Yes. And I try to, I try to explain to them, like, I understand that like by being arrested, you build like this sort of cred within your community. And it's sort of seen as like badass. But like you're gonna ruin the like the rest of your life is gonna be fundamentally harder because of like a stupid decision you made when you were 16 years old. Like what happened to Miklo, right? He made a stupid decision when he's like supposed to be what 18, 19 years old, and his, yeah, the rest of kinda, his life yeah. is ruined. And that's that's that's, I mean, that's kind of like the in. yeah, that's kind of like the idea of the movie too. It's like you know, it's just I think the movie is trying to say like you know, people really do need like a sense of like purpose a sense of family yeah um because crew like a crew's being a good example right like he's a great painter he accidentally gets his essentially his brother his little brother killed and his family hate him forever and they turn their back away from him and he just sinks further into his heroin addiction right um and uh yeah, like you know there needs to be like a, a sense of like forgiveness right and, and that comes at the end which is you know a great moment when they meet at the grave and they're just yeah. like you know they kind of forgive each other because at the end of the day it's like well you know this sucked but you know we have this sense of family and togetherness and you know people are willing to do a lot of things for that um and you know the problem is of course that like you know revenge and violence you know once it gets going it just doesn't stop you know uh especially with like the prison subplot here you know once one person gets killed then another person's out for revenge and then they kill that person you know it's just you know stuff like that it's just you know the, i think the movie demonstrates that really well just how like um you know it just doesn't end 
this just nonstop, uh, you know, again, cycle of violence. Yeah. And it just doesn't, it's just not going to lead into any good places. There's a bit, at least when I talk to some of the kids who have seen this movie, because apparently like among the teenage Latino population, this is a very popular movie for whatever I think it's reason. Probably just, I wonder if like, like their parents or whatever, just like, yeah, it this must movie, be. you know, you know, yeah, I just think just like, like it's just pop. It's like, and... like a cult classic among like people that aren't Certain us, you know? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And when you talk to the kids about it, like they kind of miss that whole thing. Like they love the violence and the sex and the gang stuff and they kind of miss this whole idea of forgiveness and how violence only creates more violence <laughs> it it has like a robocop kind of thing going on where like right it, yeah sometimes it, if you yeah. like if you don't watch it or like if you watch it in a certain way you kind of take the completely wrong message from it Right. And Paco, he's like a good kind of like um, character that sort of gets that early on, but he, he's kind of approaching it in a way that's maybe a little too cold, right? Like mm-hmm. he's got like, he understand he understands from the beginning of which is why he's become a cop is that, you know, violence or, you know, like, uh, you know, uh, he uses violence against criminals and stuff like that. Like we see him kill <laughs> criminals and stuff like that. But he's a very <laughs> violent person, but he's, he, he, he wants to, utilize his violence in what he believes to be good for good right so eliminating drugs which killed his you know has affected you know his family members which you know he's obviously very passionate about just you know just eliminating from his neighborhood and helping you know his you know people who live in his neighborhood um uh uh but yeah and and he is also a, a someone who um doesn't forgive Cruz either. It takes him a while for him to forgive him um yeah. for the death. Um so yeah, it's like he he kind of he kind of gets what we're saying here which is like, you know, uh, violence and crime it just never ends, you know, if you get mm-hmm. started in it it's just like a never ending thing which things going from bad to worse, which is why he probably, you know, decides to join the military and then become a cop. Um his approach isn't maybe the best way to go about it i guess yeah it's almost like given the same world given the same aggression it's three different ways we can sort of utilize aggression and the way that that aggression can sort of tear us apart i mean we see the one end with sort of the him becoming in the military and becoming a, a detective and sort of the ups and downs of that and how like without forgiveness it's still is full of violence and crime and it still kind of does just angry itself. the whole movie right he's just so angry <laughs> and then you have the painter who sort of expresses their aggression through their artwork but of, of course like they get hurt and then they try to like cope with medications opiates and eventually heroin and then kind of the downfall of that and then uh, of course miglo who sort of utilize aggression as sort of like a leadership tactic to try to control the situation but the thing is like all three sort of fail because at the end of the day they are still utilizing aggression to try to live in the world instead of sort of coming from a place of peace and calmness and acceptance and most importantly as we keep saying over and over again this idea of forgiveness and that's kind of the only place where any of them find any peace is when they're able to forgive not only each other but also themselves yeah which is basically what happens at the end of the movie um i don't know if you want to get into like the drug stuff like in the prison i mean Mm. i do really like the twist of you know i don't want to like go in through it's kind of a it's very complex but i do (laughs) really love the twist that like from the beginning they plan to get their um leader killed and then that was that's crazy <laughs> like the their leader that they love in order to make their gang more, more powerful yeah so that that was uh that was pretty crazy i i liked all that stuff but it's not it's not really necessary to go through and go through all the semantics just cuz like you know just watch There's the movie so much. i don't know <laughs> yeah <laughs> but i do like the ending i think i thought the ending was um 
Um, I like the ending. I don't know how you feel about it. I don't remember the ending at all. <laughs> I they go, don't know they why. Go to the mur- they go to the mural. Uh huh. The, of the three of them, which I thought was very moving. I yeah, found that very moving. That's right. When it, yeah, yeah. it's like a mural, uh, at the canal or whatever you call it, like kind of yeah, like the, a sewer. The, you always really, see those in movies. It's all that the really time. famous Los Angeles, like an canal, aqueduct. Right? Like I think it's an yeah. aqueduct. Um, yeah. and they have like a mural. It's like an old mural of all the three of them at when they were young, which is like a very moving moment. And yeah. it's like Paco and Cruz, and they're just like talking it out. And I think ultimately Cruz is just like, look, like you. It's kind of your fault that Miklo is in the position that he is. So the least that you could do is forgive him. And he, and he essentially does, even though he's not there. Yeah. Um, I like the ending just because like, you know, people always talk about like satisfying and unsatisfying endings. Mm-hmm. For me, that's kind of like in the middle where it's like, we went through like so much throughout the movie. And I was expecting like one of them to at least die. Like one of the three mm-hmm. guys. Um, but none of them do. It almost no. kind of just, it just kind of ends like on a on a like on a note which feels inconclusive but i wouldn't necessarily say that it's unsatisfying yeah i mean so much has happened in this 3 hours that i almost feel like the lack of a conclusion feels very much purposeful in the sense that like I think when we often think of the ending of a film, we kind of want everything to just end, right? Everything to just be like happily ever after and all of this. But the idea of this piece is that forgiveness isn't just something like you do one time and then it's over, right? But rather you don't you're going to have see, to live. You don't even see Paco um, say, so, or, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I forgive you right. in the movie. Yeah. And, and so it's this idea that like forgiveness is something that's, continual like it's not just something that happens once you're yeah. done it's like it's forever like you will always have to have that forgiveness for the things that we have done as individuals and as groups and as communities and so at these final moments it's kind of like you have to almost as the audience member you kind of have to take this on into the world into your community into your people and to recognize that like it's not just you're forgiving them for this one thing and then it's over and then we're all good it's this is constant and it's not just forgiving for new things, but it's like, even if it's just the same thing, like it's, that's a thing that you have to kind of always do and and kind of moving away from this idea of like, you know, forgive and forget, like you can't forget it. Like it's always going to be there. That memory, that part of you is always going to be there and you need to sort of, instead of forget it, you need to recognize that and accept that and be willing to live with that. Um, provide your final thoughts austin yeah so (laughs) i was very surprised by this movie and some very 90s vibes going on a lot of big name actors which i did not expect particularly like big name in the latino community which is really exciting to see and there's so much going on i mean we talk about how ambitious this film is i mean going to the prison twice and all these different storylines and different plot points and a million different characters all just well developed in their own way too i think each character is genuinely intriguing not just our three main protagonists here but all of our characters they all have like these just interesting plot points and wants and desires and needs and i think that's a show of some really great writing even if it's feels sometimes like it's hidden under sort of a mask of the way that they speak. I mean, they speak very much of people of this era in the 1970s and 80s. And I think it'd be kind of easy to overlook sort of the beauty of the writing and the storytelling here. And visually, I don't think there's anything particularly exciting for me. Yeah, like the the director, the, the director Taylor Hackford, like, you know, He's fine. Like he's competent. He's competent. And that's all I can really say about the direction. I don't think there's anything yeah, bad whatever. about it, but there's yeah. just nothing like for it's me not, to really, really talk about, about that. on that end. No, it, it's really not. So 
I I enjoyed the piece. Uh, I found myself confused at times just because there was so much going on. I get why someone would want to watch it multiple times just because there's there's so much there. And I do think that this could use a uh, treatment in sort of the world of television or just a longer piece. I mean, no one's going to watch a four-hour movie, so it would have to be sort of a series. And I, I think that's the big flaw of this piece is it's too ambitious. It's trying to tell too many stories at once. There's just too much going on. I feel like we can't hold on to any of these characters. I feel like we're just kind of thrown from place to place that we never get enough time to sort of really live with any of these characters. So I'm going to give this movie a strong six out of 10. Yeah. I'll give it a seven out of 10 bordering on an eight. I I really, really liked it. I think it's, I think the movie is vivid and interesting and exciting enough to really carry it into a territory that I think is like really, really great. Um, Yeah. You know, uh, I just, you know, I think a story like this ought to be told, you know, um, I don't think they probably don't get told enough. Yeah. Um, um, I think everybody in the movie is fun. You know, they're doing their thing. Um, you know, and I don't know, there's, it's just kind of like a good solid movie. There's nothing, there's not like a lot of pretensions behind it. It's just kind of like, mm. it's just kind of like, it's just a really good solid effort into creating a crime genre move, crime drama movie that takes place in this, in these different environments, San Quentin prison and East Los Angeles and portray that and have this be just like this big, huge, crazy, insane, um, dramatic, tragic film. Um, and I thought they, I thought they pulled that off quite a bit. Um, it's probably underrated. Um, cause I think I, it's not doesn't appear to be very discussed very often, um, at least among, uh, let's just say like white people probably like <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean like come on, I, I still stand by the idea that this could be a great TV show. I mean like it it this uh, again if this was made in the two thousands and it was made into like a multiple part HBO Showtime FX show, it would be considered one of the greatest shows of all time. I I I I, I'm, I stand by that. So I'll give it the, you know, I'll give it the seven out of 10 for now, but yeah, pretty good. All right. Yeah. I, I couldn't help but agree. I think there's so much potential in this piece and there, there's so much more to be told in this piece that I, I would just love to see more of this in the future, but all right, y'all. Uh, thank you for listening. You can find everything I do at awesome to go one too. Yeah, you can follow me on Letterbox at Retro Andrew R E T R Zero Andrew. And you can find this podcast wherever you hear podcasts. You can also find us Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube at With Nothing to Say or our, our Patreon at uh, patreon.com slash LTF Productions. And thank you all for listening. Thanks. Thanks.